Every professional fighter has a reason why they started fighting. Ever wondered what my reason was? Well, stay tuned and I'll share my reasons why I started fighting. Right on. What's up, everybody, and welcome to the Yamato Damashi podcast. My name is James, and I'm joined by the man himself, Mr. Ensign Inoue. Today, we're going to be talking about what actually brought Ensign into fighting. So, Ensign, I'm going to leave it over to you. What what kind of brought you into, you know, what stirred your interest into actually getting into training initially? Well, my my parents and uh, my brother was into the martial arts. They were doing karate. My, my, my grandfather was actually a karate instructor. So my family was kind of into it, but I don't know. I guess I was more of a passive kid. I was, wasn't really into it. And I actually uh, started wanting to get into it uh, later on in life. Actually, my first uh, experience with karate was when I was, I, I don't know, I think I was about seven or eight. And I decided to, you know, my mom was a brown belt. Egan was a brown belt. My grandpa was a black belt. And I just figured maybe I go into that to try it out. So when I tried it out, and you remember very, very specifically, I had a teacher named Daryl Lee. And he was teaching karate in, in the town that I lived. And I remember going to the class, and it must have been like the second or third class I went to. He had us get into our karate stance, and it's supposed to be like a very, you have to have your legs in the right place so it's a sturdy stance. So that if the teacher comes around and tries to lightly sleep, sweep you, you should be able to hold your ground. And that day when he came around, he, he kicked my leg and my, he kicked my leg out of me and I fell on my ass. And it, I was just so embarrassed, I got up and ran out of the gym. And I remember this real specifically because when I went to the gym and I went downstairs to call my parents, to, I wanted to say, I'm done with this shit. I wanted my mom then to pick me up. I remember going downstairs and I, the pay phones, I couldn't reach the pay phones to put the money in the pay phones. So I was that little. I actually I had to call, ask a construction worker to call for me or die or get put in the money for me, right. and then when I called, I just told my parents to come pick me up. So that was my first uh, experience with martial arts, and I didn't touch martial arts for a while after that. The reason why I started training again in martial arts is because in Hawaii there's a lot of street fights. So back in the day there was there wasn't much guns. If anything, the worst thing would happen was a knife. But um, it was pretty, uh, you solve your problems stepping outside. So that, right. was a whole, that, was a, that was a whole thing, like, oh, let's take it outside. Right. And was there, was there any particular story that sort of springs to mind about street fights? Is there any one that sort of stands out to you? Um, well, in, uh, when we are in uh, intermediate school, there was a, you know, when, when the intermediate schools merged, uh, so, so, our, so my elementary school was in my town, so it was everyone from our town. And the intermediate schools would mix three different towns together. And one of the towns that was mixed together with us was uh, this town called Papakalea, where it had all the Hawaiians and the, you know, the bigger people. So we went there, we got our lunch taken away, and I remember there was a group of guys, uh, Billy Keka, Puna, and Avis. Those three guys were like notorious for picking on people. And there were so many days uh, when I would, uh, you know, in school, they'd, they'd take the money, take my lunch monies and stuff. And I, I remember standing up for to them. And I can't really specifically say there was a certain fight, but it was always just, we always faced up. They're always walking through the, the class, the hallways. And when they see me walking by, they come out of the class and try to pick a fight. And we face up and someone would come and break it up. So. It was continuously stuff like that with them. So, you know, for for me, you know, if you if somebody cuts you off in the road, get out of the car. There's a lot of times you get into a fist fight. So it, it was something that I wanted to do is to protect myself. Yeah, no, it makes sense to do, especially when you're in that environment, right? You need to be prepared. So, given you had that sort of mindset as a, as a child, what got you? brought back to the martial arts then because you obviously you know when you're younger it wasn't for you 
you then start getting to a bit more street fights. That is that what you're saying? That that's kind of what like what sort of made yeah, you feel so, like you need to protect yourself. Yeah. So my whole mission was to protect myself. So of course, as you know, there's a lot of martial arts out there. Hmm. There's a whole bunch of them. So I was on the on the quest when I was. I think it was in high school already. I was in the quest of finding the martial art that would be able, you'd be able to use it on the street right away. So I tried a lot of different martial arts. I tried Aikido. And Aikido was, um, you know, you know, they, they, you, you work with the opponent's energy. Mm -hmm. So when he, when he gives, you take, when he takes, you give, you know, so it was that flow of uh, harmonizing your energy with your opponent. And I remember my Aikido teacher, I was talking to my Aikido teacher and asking him, and damn, it's so hard to, you know, you don't know what type of energy they're coming at you, you don't, what, what kind of force they're coming at. So how do you harmonize it? And he even told me something like, uh, you have to train many, many years to learn that. And I'm thinking, oh, so, and I also approached him with, you know, like even if I fight what the same person 10 times, it's 10 different energies. Mm -hmm. I mean, how the hell do you actually learn to match that? He goes, well, some of the masters trained 60 years to, to, to learn that. I'm, I'm thinking to myself, 60 freaking years. I'm thinking of defending myself next weekend. <laughs> so, you know, for me, Aikido was pretty much out. Um, I tried Taekwondo. Taekwondo is really good, but, you know, Taekwondo um, requires space. Well, a lot of high kicks, a lot of spinning kicks. You know, if, if you're fighting in a library, there's not going to have room for that. You know, so Taekwondo, I, I did like you know the, the way they they executed the sidekick. I, I like the way they emphasized flexibility, but as far as uh, applicable on the streets, there was very little. Um, I also tried. Um, I found Muay Thai. There was this guy teaching in um, Hawaii that was teaching for free at a park every Thursday night. So I joined them. I really like Muay Thai. Yeah. I a, a, a friend of mine introduced me to Wing Chun. And I like that sticky hands on Wing Chun. So, you know, I was kind of putting things together like, okay, when we're far away, Muay Thai would be good. And once you make contact, Wing Chun, Jet Kune Do would be good. You know, sticky hands of flowing. And, you know, for, for me back in the day, it was all about, you know, knocking the guy out, punching him in the face, you know, that kind of thing. Jiu-Jitsu actually opened, opened everyone's eyes to what street fighting is really about. So, you know, for, I, I was doing, you know, I, I, I was doing more Wing Chun and Muay Thai. And one day in, my co in college, I came across uh, a Brazilian guy with a TV, with a video playing. And he was playing this video called Gracie Jiu-Jitsu in Action. And I stood there and watched it. And wow, it was like, it wasn't like those, you know, those nice little round kicks you see in uh, Taekwondo or... It was really messy. It was like like real ugly street fighting, positioning and pounding on the ground. So when I saw that, I was kind of like, "Wow, this is a uh, this is interesting." And I kept I stood there for like that like forty minutes, I think, just watching all the and all the Gracie Gracie practitioners would win pretty handedly. And then they fought karate guys, and once they got up to the ground, those guys were a fish out of water. And and still, I wasn't I wasn't impressed to a level that I was convinced because in Hawaii, you know, we believed that the bigger guy was a stronger guy. So if um, you're fighting somebody or you're going to get into a fight, the bigger guy is supposed to win, pretty much. Mm -hmm. So what really convinced me was the the last fight on that tape was uh, Hickson against Zulu, right, and yeah. Zulu was huge. You know, Zulu was huge, and I'm standing there watching this and okay. I don't care how good this the technique is, this this black guy is way bigger. And they're they're promoting it, Gracie Jiu Jitsu. I'm saying, don't tell me this little guy's gonna beat this black guy. So I'm watching that and you know, it was it seemed like it was a kind of a drawn out fight, and then Hickson eventually takes his back and chokes him out cold. And right there when I saw it, I was like I was sold, man. And uh that's when I I signed up for the class and went down to do Gracie Jiu Jitsu. So well, my whole thing was about defending myself on the streets. Yeah. And I suppose Gracie Jiu Jitsu just seemed like it lent itself way more to it um, than, you know, maybe something like Aikido or, or Taekwondo. So it seemed like. Yeah, uh, I, mean, I think the video, the Gracie Jiu Jitsu action video, points out a lot of uh, important points. Like 90% of street fights will go to the ground. Mm hmm. 
So rarely do you see a street fight where guys are standing toe to toe. There's always a tackle, boom, it gets ugly. They go to the ground, they're rolling on the ground, you know. So a lot of most of the street fights will do that. So when when that, you know, when they, they mentioned that, you know, and they fought uh, you know, all these different practitioners, boxers, karate, taekwondo guys, and once they got onto the ground, those guys were literally a fish out of water. I was like, Oh, I gotta learn this thing, man. So I guess what I'm curious about is um some people may not know this but you had quite a career in in racquetball um and i'm curious to know sort of how that came about and were you doing gracie jiu-jitsu while you were doing racquetball was it something you guys you, you did simultaneously yeah i was actually doing racquetball before that right so i i right out of high school i started um i was already real avid in playing racquetball and what I started to do was I started to um, follow my brother on the pro tour. So Egan uh, was the real guy, the real racquetball player. He was the he actually became the best in the world. He was the Hawaii champ for a long time, and I just kind of came up behind him, you know, trying to, you know, do what older brothers doing. Um, I don't think I was dedicated enough as much as he was. I didn't train as hard as he did. Um, he. He definitely was always a level above me, but I, you know, I was chasing that dream, and it was it was convenient for me because Egan was already pretty big, so he had sponsors, he had a, uh, you know, all these uh, free hotels, <laughs> so I kind of stayed in his free hotels. Uh, a lot of the, some of the sponsors gave me rackets and stuff because I was his brother, or sometimes I would I, would, I wore the same size shoes as him, so some of his shoe sponsors he would give me some of his shoes, you know, so. I was pretty much living and, and trying to chase a dream um, be, uh, under Egan's shadow, pretty much, and try my best. Uh, and uh, I actually, uh, the best rank I got to was 28 in the world, which isn't that good. And I, I toured for, I think, two years. And it came to a point where I, I wasn't making enough money to even make any money, let alone my parents are paying for all my uh, my plane rides and my trips to uh, to to play in the pro tour because I live in Hawaii. Every every tournament was a long distance. You know, every every tournament was a far trip for Hawaii. There's no close flights, so that you know was something that I did, and that was actually my one of my first dreams is to become one of the best racquetball players in the world. And fighting was definitely not what I was thinking about. Right. So. How did that transition from becoming, you know, being 28th in the world, you know, 20, rank 28th is pretty, still pretty good. You might be, <laughs> might be downplaying a little bit there. But, but how do you go from that to suddenly thinking, actually, you know, maybe I'd like to try something like no holds barred fighting? Well, what actually happened with that is um, being 28th in the world when racquetball was a, like a, a sport that wasn't really striving too good because the ball was too fast so they couldn't get it televised so the pro tour actually was going really bad they used to have about 12 to 14 tournaments a year and it dwindled down to like six tournaments a year and it was like to a point where they were not even having tournaments so some of the clubs that did couldn't wasn't running tournaments would invite you know like top four players to play in a little tournament for the for the hometown fans and of course when you got one through 27 not having a job they're they're never going to look at 28 and ask invite him over to do that so with six tournaments only only six tournaments there's nothing else to do i mean i really had to sit back and figure out what i wanted to do and so what i did was the reason how i got the transition into fighting was because when i, I retired racquetball went back to school and that story i told you about the brazilian guy set up, had a tv set up at the campus he was advertising a non-credit course called Ju gracie jiu-jitsu and so because i retired from racquetball and went back to school i stumbled onto gracie jiu-jitsu uh, okay. Amazing. So that's how the transition into from racquetball to martial arts actually happened. And, you know, the, from there, I, you know, I, I was, I got head over heels into Gracie Jiu-Jitsu every single day. I mean, that's all I lived, Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. 
and that was my whole thing now my whole my whole shift move moves to i want to become a good i don't remember always thinking i want to get a black belt because to me i guess i just started and a black belt was an unattainable goal that was far 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 away mm -hmm. so i don't think ever that was ever in my mind to, to be, become a black belt in jiu-jitsu i think it was just to get good get good as good as as good as i can and um, I trained a lot of jiu-jitsu, and it was funny how my move to Japan was not from martial arts. It was actually from racquetball. Egan was uh, still one of the top pros in the world, so he was really busy on the tour and still being invited to tournaments or invited to, like, exhibition matches. And he previous year before that, he went to Japan and played in Japan. And he won the Japan Open, so he was invited to come back the following year they were really excited to have Egan back because he was like a big celebrity there to them. And because of his, his obligations to the pro tour, he couldn't. So they're, they're, they're looking like, oh, they were, everyone was looking forward to seeing Egan come up. And they had this thing like, oh, wait, Egan can't. What about his brother Ensign? <laughs> so I was like second choice. Like, hey, why don't you come up and play? And for me, I, I, to me, I, mean, I, I'm, I have Japanese blood, but Japan was a foreign place to me. We had, a, we had the image in Hawaii that Japanese girl had crooked teeth, hair on their legs, you know, it was like, ugh. And then they spoke a whole different language. So we, you know, we really couldn't relate to the people that they were. Right. So I, it wasn't like I wanted to, I liked Japan at all. I just thought, wow, free trip. And bottom line, I am Japanese roots, can go, go to the country of my roots, see it for free, you know, check it out and, you know, go to play a racquetball tournament and that's what actually made me accept the offer to go play in japan and what is that uh 30 34 34 years later yeah oh, shit. How, is it 34 years i mean no 30 <laughs> years later okay 30 years later i'm still here just just as a bit of an offshoot uh just while we're talking about japan uh what was your first impressions of, of going to japan because obviously you you probably had like a few ideas of some things, given like your grandparents and, and your, your your family. Being of a Japanese, uh, being a Japanese American, um, your parents and my my great great grandparents were Japanese. Mm -hmm. My you know, and then it goes down the generations. So we had a lot of customs that the Japanese have that we had we kept in the household. So as far as that type of culture shock, there wasn't there was a very little, but the just the whole place, the people, the you know the. The trains, the hustle and bustle, the the cleanliness of the country, the mannerisms of the people. It was a lot of things that really like um, kind of caught me off guard. Yeah. And you know what actually caught me off guard the most is the fact that I wasn't considered Japanese. Because in in Hawaii, in Hawaii, they call Hawaii a melting pot of America. There's uh, every single race in there. You know, you can you can draw a circle around a mile radius and you'll have like every single race in there. You have some Japanese guys, you have some Chinese guys, you have some Filipinos, you have some Hawaiians, you know, you have you have Caucasians, you have all the mix in there. Yeah. So, you know, like it, it's just such a mix up, you know, for so when we're walking around as kids, um, when people used to ask us our nationality, it wasn't American, it was uh, Japanese. The Filipino guy with an American passport, what national are you? He's a Japanese, uh, Filipino. Mm -hmm. So we considered ourselves what our ethnic background was. Mm -hmm. So that was a big, the biggest shock to me when I went came to Japan. I'm thinking, I'm Japanese. And the Japanese people looked at me and said, no, you're not. You're a foreigner. Right. And that, that was a big shock to me. I couldn't, you know, I couldn't stay in the country longer than three months unless I, I got... You know, a sponsor and a, and a and a visa from that person. Um, I couldn't buy a car with my name on it at the time. If you buy a house, you couldn't own more than fifty percent of the house. There's a lot of stuff in in Japan that you know you can look at it as prejudice, and you could or you or you could also look at it that they just really protect their own people. Yeah. So that was really shocking for me. That was the biggest thing in Japan when I moved here. Was holy shit! I'm not Japanese. Yeah, there's a, a lot to get your head around. I know just from going myself, uh, and there was a, a huge bit of a culture shock for me, but also just little things like so much paperwork. 
<laughs> yeah, oh well, yeah, the limit before to stay in Japan. Even till today. Yeah. Thirty years later, I'm still filling out papers once a year. Yeah. To stay if, in the country. If you guys haven't seen it, check out Ensign's recent video. Uh what was it, five times to get your documents checked just to get back in the country? Well, that's because of COVID. Yeah. Yeah, so the, a lot of paperwork in Japan. Yeah, but I'll tell you what, with, even with COVID, here in the UK, people are just walking straight over the border. So, so Japan's, <laughs> Japan's strict, but hey, you know, you got to do what you got to do. Um, so just getting back, um, just to sort of finalize just what we were talking about earlier. So you, you come to Japan, um, you get a bit, of, a bit of a flavor of the country, um, you do like the racquetball tournaments. Um, so, so how do you come to the decision that hey, maybe I should should try out a professional fight? Well, I was actually just playing racquetball, and a big thing with me that that's important to understand is when I was uh, in sports, I was always amazed at the fact that you could practice a shot or a pitch or a sh or a racquetball shot for hours and hours every day. And then when you get into the tournament, just because there's people watching, there's a referee, there's, there's a, you know, the spotlights on, the nerves go up. And I, you know, I got shot that I could hit like 90% of the time. All of a sudden the percentage dropped to like 30%, 50%, depending on, on how well my, my movement was that day. So I was always impressed with the fact that to in order to execute what you've practiced you have to be able to control your nerves you have to be, be able to calm yourself not get too nervous not get too excited and i've i've i've, I've been i was on that mission in, in sports to continuously try to calm myself enough that i could be the same ensign that's in the practice court you know, it's the same incident in the tournament could be in the same incident in the practice court. And I, I felt, you know, for even baseball, I played a lot of baseball, you know, you're hitting batting practice, you can hit way better than you can in the game because you can see the same pitch coming, but because you're a little tight, you're a little slow, timing's a little off, bat comes around a little too late, you know, you, you don't, you can't hit the solid line drives that you, you could during batting practice. So for me, I, I felt that, it was like a mission always to try and be a, be the same person you can in practice. And what what actually made me, what actually uh, made a little shift in my thinking was when I was a little kid, I saw a, a movie that the guy was driving with his family in a car and his car went over the cliff. It rolled over and then it, it ended up like on, upside down. He got out of the car and the car was on fire and because he panic was panicking he couldn't open the door and when i saw that it was real funny because it had a little light bulb that linked to the to the to the sports like wow it's just like sports he could open the car every day and even if you you know if he's in a regular situation and he's approached with an upside down car and they tell him to open the door he'd probably be able to open it but the only reason why he couldn't open the car door is because he was panicking and because of that, his his family died. And so when I saw that, I thought, wow, that's just like just like sports. You can do something in practice, but because you're nervous or you're, you know, the, the spotlight's on you, all of a sudden you can't be the same person. You can't do the things that you, you normally could do. So I felt that it was, you know, controlling your emotions, being able to control your nerves. So for me, it was, you know, it was about, you know, my goal in sports was always to try and become that same person that's in practice. And I felt I did pretty good. I mean, I never got to that point in racquetball where if I could hit a shot nine out of ten times, I never felt confident I could do it in the tournament nine out of ten times. The percentage would always drop, but the percentage actually came to a point where it wasn't too bad. And, you know, as I'm training Gracie Jiu-Jitsu, I, I, you know, I remember there was a year, 1994, when Hickson fought in Japan. I was already in Japan playing racquetball, you know, trying to, teach english and play racket at the same time mm -hmm. and i was invited uh, i was invited by hickson to go watch the fight he gave me some tickets to come and i remember watching that fight he he was fighting i remember he was fighting this guy david lubecki 
and he's huge. This guy was huge. And he's not just a big guy. He was a, he was a disciplined professional martial artist. So for me, you know, Hickson was a personal friend. So I was kind of worried about how he'd do. And when Hickson won, I, I remember, I remember losing control of myself, jumping up on the seat, screaming. And like, I caught myself like, Oh, this is not you. You don't do that. You, you kind of sit quietly and maybe make a fist and say, yes, he won, you know, but I was out of control. And I realized that it was because I couldn't control my emotions. And then that light lit another light bulb in me thinking that, holy shit, if I'm watching a friend fight in the ring and I can't control myself, can you imagine how it would be if I was the one in the ring? So from there, everything shifted to um, finding a, a ring to get into. I didn't carry. I just wanted, you know, that it, it, fighting is a whole different sport. You know, basketball. What's the um, objective of basketball? Of course, there's elbows. You get sticks sometimes. Mm-hmm. You know, offensive foul. Sometimes you, you get run over by the player with the ball. You know, but the objective of the sport is to put the ball through the hoop. Football. Football is pretty aggressive. You, you get stick. You get a clothesline. Some people break their necks. But the objective of the sport is to get the ball across the line. You know, so no matter, you know, how hardcore a sport is and how dangerous and, and, you know, you say contact sports, the objective is never to hurt your opponent. So, you know, when you when you got fighting, I guess maybe because, you know, if I was watching Hickson play a racquetball tournament or I watch Egan play a lot of racquetball tournaments, I'm nervous, but never to that point where I lose control. Yeah, that makes well, sense. The Hickson fight, when Hickson won, I did lose control. And I think it's because the objective of fighting is to hurt your opponent, hmm. whether it be punching him in the head so hard that he loses consciousness or, or locking him in a joint lock where you can break his joints or tear his ligaments. Or if you just get him in a choke and put him to sleep. So, the, you know, that's the uh, fighting is a whole different thing. And so mm-hmm. it brings that like, anxiety. So I felt, man, if I can learn to control this, or even if I can just get in there in one time to experience that anxiety, I just thought that I would be able to, you know, next, if in, in a life in this situation, if I'm in that situation where I have to save somebody. I felt that I could be more level-headed than I would be if I didn't have this first experience. So for me, it was, I never thought of getting into the ring more than once. I just thought one time, get that experience on controlling the anxiety, whether I control it or not, just getting that experience once I felt it would better prepare me. Yeah. So that was the whole mission. I started, you know, trying to find somewhere that I could, you know, get into the ring. And for me, I'm, I'm being smart about it. I'm not, I'm not dumb, and I'm not going to say I'll, I'll go whatever boxing ring. Okay, I don't know how to box, but I'll, I'll go into the ring. Yeah, I was being realistic. I wanted to at least have a chance in it, because if I just get beaten up real bad, it's like it, there's, there's not as much uh, time in the ring that you can learn to control anxiety. So I wanted to find somewhere that what I knew, jiu-jitsu, could be applied in that ring. Mm-hmm. So I started calling around, looking for that ring to get into, and it was about just getting into that ring one time. Yeah, and yeah, I, I called a bunch of places. Yeah, and so if you watch my career, the whole thing that now knowing the background story on why I went into the ring, it wasn't because it wasn't for the riches, it wasn't for the sponsorship, it wasn't to become famous. It was actually to learn to control my anxiety. And what's interesting about that whole thing is through my whole career. I kept that objective. I didn't lose sight of that goal. So the fighters that I chose to fight wasn't fighters that I thought could, I could beat. It was fighters that I thought was going to bring that anxiety and that fear in me. The fighters that were going to push me to that breaking point. It was going to actually break me. So, you know, some people would watch some of my fights, like say, for instance, the Igor Vovichanchin fight and say, man, Ensign got good jiu-jitsu. Why didn't he just take him down? Why does he go throw total toe in him? Um, you know, the, the whole reason why I started fighting, it, it just explains that I still stood, I stood focused on that objective and throughout my whole career, I did the same. I did that. I fought, I chased that objective like Igor, man. I mean, if you're going to have anxiety fighting Igor, where would the anxiety be taking him on the ground and getting on top and using your jiu-jitsu? I don't know. What is Igor? Igor's most feared element is his punching power. 
So for me, I felt as you know, call it, call me stupid, call me um, a little, um, you know, radical or, or too dangerous. Call me what you want, but my objective was to stand in the in the place that would create the most anxiety. And for Igor, it was standing toe to toe, touring blow for the blow for him. So, my my whole career was that I kept focused on. So the fighters I picked, the way I fought, if you know the story on the background on why I fought, you'll probably understand it more. Yeah, and we'll break that down in, in future episodes about what made you choose some of those fighters. Um, but yeah. I've always felt that like that was always evident in your career, even you know from the debut, which we'll get into next time, there was no amateur fight. So you know you went straight into a professional level. So, um, But yeah, we'll, we'll break that down in the, in, the, the next, in the next couple of episodes, and I'm, I'm hoping people will look forward to... Uh, hearing some more.